Today I will be discussing surviving Autodesk audits and some of the main approach for today for the agenda is discussing the four audit approaches. We will also take a note of the focus of each of the Autodesk audits in addition to a detailed look at the audit process which includes conducting the actual audit scan, negotiating and finally concluding with settling a case. In addition, we will discuss some key Autodesk licensing terms which were important to focus for future clients. In addition, we will discuss the impact of a main Autodesk case, the Verner case, and the importance of serial numbers. We will also give you a few tips about managing future compliance. There are four main approaches initiated by Autodesk. The first is by Autodesk in-house technical compliance team. They reach out to different companies that already have existing Autodesk products and ensure that all of their products are licensed properly, that there is not an over-installation of each of the products, and to offer any assistance with upgrades or compliance. In addition, Autodesk often uses outside law firms. They will send an initial letter which will detail the information that they're seeking. In addition to compliance, they're also looking for any potential copyright infringement damages. In addition, Autodesk is part of the Business Software Alliance, which is an entity that represents multiple software publishers, which range from Microsoft to Adobe. In addition to the VSA, Autodesk is also a part of the Software and Information Industry Association, which also represents multiple publishers. The focus of these audits varies depending on who they are initiated by. The VSA and SIA are primarily focused on compliance and for copyright infringement damages. As a result of those audits, any unlicensed products will be penalized in addition to a requirement that following that audit, all of the license, all of the products are properly licensed within a certain period of time ranging from 30 to 60 days. Autodesk and the initiated in-house Autodesk audit also focus on future compliance and regulating the licensing of each software product. Typically, as part of your settlement, Autodesk will offer to replace products that are found to be unlicensed and often a discounted cost built into the settlement agreement. The process is a bit lengthy and depends on the nature of the audit materials and the company at issue. It initially starts by an initial letter. From that proceeds the audit along with a number of different methods to conduct the audit, ranging from the AIA, Autodesk in-house electronic auditing tool, to self-audit. Prior to submitting the results, most clients will obtain a 408 agreement, which is an interim confidentiality agreement. At that point, they will submit the audit results and await an initial settlement demand from Autodesk or the BSA or SIA. At that point, negotiation ensues and ultimately a settlement is agreed upon along with the settlement language and the ultimate settlement payment. There are some different types of initial audit letters. As previously stated, the audit letters from the in-house Autodesk team are a little bit different from anything that is received from Autodesk Council or the BSA and SIA. The date on the letter is significant because that is the key date that the audit is focused on. A lot of the letters from the Council, from Autodesk Council or the BSA and SIA require that no changes are made to the network. For example, if a, if a company discovers that they had unlicensed software after they receive a letter, they cannot go out and clean up their system because the letter restricts that information. The purpose behind that is Autodesk and the SIA and BSA are trying to preserve that evidence in the event that settlement negotiations are unsuccessful. In addition, the, uh, the initial letter is significant because on occasion I've had a few clients who received contact from Autodesk in-house compliance team. And they did not understand the severity of the situation and either ignored the letters or just responded a little bit dismissively stating that you know, they were compliant and that they didn't, they expected the auditors to, uh, the issue to be resolved at that point. I have had a couple of cases where it was not resolved and the compliance team turned it over to Auditor's Council, at which point it became 
an issue of seeking a copyright infringement penalty as opposed to just seeking compliance. However, conversely, I have had one client who was successful at cooperating with the Autodesk auditors and sending their information. They discovered unknowingly that they had two products that were not properly licensed due to a number of factors. And we were able to resolve that matter without any penalty, just the cost of replacing those products. So it is important how you respond to these letters and making sure that you comply with their requests and requirements. For the audit discovery process, there are different types of audit discovery, and it really depends on the nature of the company at issue. Some prefer to use scanning tools, for example, the Autodesk AIA tool. There are also a number of other free scanning tools, which range from Viceworks to Bellark and just other free online software. Larger companies like to use scanning tools simply because it's more efficient. Often it's better for both cost and time management. Sometimes smaller companies that have only a matter of 10 computers or less prefer to use manual discovery and simply look at the add and remove programs on each computer and report that and compile it into data to be sent to the two audits. The AIA tool is significant recently because that is a preferred method for Autodesk in-house compliance team. Lately, I have had a few clients who have been requested to use that tool specifically because Autodesk prefers to receive the raw data to review it without any changes, which comes with some risk. There are some challenges with the discovery tools. AIA and also the other free tools are not without their, their issues. Some of them do not recognize free software. They also don't distinguish between free user tools. And this becomes a problem because I've had a client that had reported something in, in terms of about 40 full installations of a product, which was actually the free viewer. Had they turned in the information to Autodesk with uh, the indication that it was a full software product as opposed to just a free user tool or a free viewer, they it would have significantly increased their potential liability for copyright infringement penalty. So it's very important to conduct a secondary review, regardless of whether a tool is used for manual scan. The secondary review can be conducted in, in a manner of different ways. Some people prefer, like I said, in smaller environments to do a manual review of the software to make sure that everything is accurate and go to each machine to make sure that none of the free viewers or free trials or free user tools are reported inaccurately. Some larger environments prefer to hire an external IT consultant, and this makes it a little bit more efficient to go through that process and review the information obtained by the scan. It is important that if, if a company were to hire an external IT consultant, that they obtain a confidentiality agreement prior to allowing the IT consultant to review their network. The next step in the audit process involves submitting the audit results and negotiations. I briefly mentioned the Rule 408 agreement. This is an interim, interim confidentiality agreement, and it is important because prior to sending the audit results, this prevents Autodesk from using those results or disclosing those results at a later point. There are certain limitations to that disclosure, but it protects clients from their information being released by Autodesk or used against them. Time, the timeline for submitting results greatly varies between the companies involved, the nature of their audit, and also the from also from the, whoever the auditing entity is. The timeline for submitting and receiving an initial settlement demand really ranges from 30 to 90 days. I've had very rare instances where it exceeded that time period because of an overly complicated matter where Autodesk had requested additional information, my client had to supplement that information. I've also had matters that resolved extremely quickly. I've had one case that resolved in a matter of two weeks because both sides were highly motivated to resolve it. My client was willing to provide all of their information up front and was capable of resolving the settlement and making the payment in that period of time. That is a little bit unusual, but it is preferred both by Autodesk and occasionally by our clients, it's possible to resolve it that quickly. For the initial demand, once Autodesk 
comes back with that initial demand, it's really important for clients to verify the information contained in it and to make sure that Autodesk has properly credited them with their appropriate licenses. On occasion, Autodesk will ask additional questions. For example, if you did not provide the serial number, but only the receipt or invoice from your purchase, they may request that information. And it will be helpful to supply that subliminal in certain circumstances in order to obtain the proper credit. Because you don't want to be in a position where you've submitted your, your license information and you're not credited and you're penalized for a product that you properly purchased. At that point, once you have verified and negotiated the information and the payment terms, ultimately our clients generally really reach settlement. Almost all of my cases end in settlement. I personally have never had one that went to litigation. So the settlement is important because Autodesk, unlike a BSA and SIA, will include software purchases. So if you have products that are unlicensed as part of settlement, often you can get a discount on the pricing in order to replace the software that was not authorized or was not properly licensed. At that point, you will negotiate the terms of the settlement agreement. Autodesk typically does not accept many changes to their standard settlement agreement. It is rare that they will accept a, a major change to that agreement. However, typically we request to include a post-settlement confidentiality agreement that prevents Autodesk or our clients from discussing the terms of settlement. Some of our clients prefer to not have that provision since the audit itself was so problematic. They prefer to disclose everything about the audit to the public. But most companies like to avoid the bad publicity associated with it, so they prefer to obtain the confidentiality agreement. In addition, we try to include different terms that limit the liability of our clients as part of uh, resolving the settlement agreement. We have had one case recently where we were able to negotiate a, a change to one of the terms for our client who was seeking to deduct his settlement payment from his taxes. He requested that we change the term from settlement payment to software purchase. He was purchasing some software products as part of settlement. Autodesk did accept that change, but um, it's unclear whether he will ultimately be able to deduct that from his taxes. For post-settlement obligations, there are a few terms contained in the agreement, which includes purchase requirements and compliance. Autodesk, if they include software packages as part of your settlement agreement, and they will they will include they will include a provision which requires you to uninstall any unlicensed software within five days of receiving the new software. In addition, sometimes in their settlement agreements, they will have purchase requirements which require the client to make purchases directly through Autodesk or Autodesk Council for a period of 12 to 18 months. This is to ensure that clients are not obtaining purchases and Autodesk products from unauthorized resellers. There are certain key licensing terms in the agreement for the software license agreement. For installation, there are certain terms for installation use and backup copies. And it depends on the type of license that is obtained. For example, the standalone license can only be installed on one computer for one person's use. They may also install one backup copy, which is only to be used if something happens to the initial copy. In addition, a person may also install one laptop copy for use by someone who also owns a, um, owns a desktop. The purpose is that the laptop copy is only used for remote access purposes if a person is traveling. They're not meant to be used concurrently. In addition, many of their products also have geographic restrictions, which require you to purchase the Autodesk product and use it in the same territory or location that you purchased it from. There are different types of licenses. One of those is the network license. And this may be licensed on a file server, and they will have a certain amount of access for users. For example, a network can come with a certain amount, say 10, 10 users, and no, no one may access more than 10 concurrent users from that file server. 
There are a couple of other types of licenses, which include the educational student version. Those are meant solely for personal or educational use. They have restrictions on use for business or commercial purposes. In addition, the trial or evaluation versions are used only for testing, and they also have restrictions on use for commercial purposes as well. For upgrades and cross-grades, if you purchase a subscription, you have certain other rights and ability, ease, ability to more easily access the upgrade and cross-grade. Each of these also have restrictions, so it's important to note that if you upgrade a product, you have a certain period of time to uninstall or remove the previous product. And that time varies based on the product. On, for example, for some AutoCAD, it's 120 days. For cross grades, that period of time is generally around 60 days. One of the key provisions that's very important for many of our clients is transferability. There are restrictions on the resale and transferability of each of these products. And that is outlined very specifically in each of the agreements. You cannot sell, distribute, rent, loan, sublicense, or lease any of these products. And that's where often our clients get into trouble when they're purchasing for, from someone who is an unauthorized reseller who is not, is, is not able to convey a proper license to our clients. In addition, another important licensing term is audits and inspections. Autodesk can, in their license agreement, with reasonable notice, inspect and audit a company. And this may be done either electronically, which is the result of many of these initial letters that, that our clients receive, but they may also reserve the right to conduct an in-person audit during a client's regular business hours. If unlicensed software is found as a result of that audit, the, the company must pay unpaid licensing fees. And also, what's important about this provision is if Autodesk finds that the licenses are unauthorized, they may terminate the license. For example, if you've over-installed many of your licenses, they may render that license void. One of the key cases that helped shape a little bit of the licensing terms and make a few amendments to the software licensing agreement is Burner v. Autodesk. The background of this case started in 1999 when Autodesk audited Cardwell Thomas & Associates, ETA. As a result of that, audit, the company obtained 10 licenses of Autodesk release 14. They, at, at a later point in time, upgraded their product and chose to resell those 10 licenses, four of which were purchased by Timothy Werner. Timothy Werner regularly sold products on eBay for a profit, and in 2005, he began to sell the release 14 copies that he obtained from CTA. Autodesk initiated what is called DMCA takedown notices, so the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which offers certain protections for copyright holders. A takedown notice is, an, is a notice to a website operator that they may, be, may have copyrighted material posted on their website. So typically to avoid liability, the website offer will remove that information. However, the DMCA offers an ability for the person, the user, whose information is taken down to file a counter notice, which can test that copyright infringement is occurring. Werner, copy, Werner filed these counter notices on each of these, these sales, which was about three at this point, and Autodesk did not respond. So eBay reinstated each of his sales, and he was ultimately able to sell these products. On the fourth product that he attempted to sell much later, Autodesk filed another DMCA takedown notice, and so eBay suspended his account. At this point, he filed another counter notice, which Autodesk did not respond to, so he was able to reinstate his account and make that sale. He did, however, as part of his procedural history, he filed a declaratory judgment action against Autodesk seeking injunctive relief against takedown notices a declaration that he was not violating Autodesk copyright and damages for lost revenue. He ultimately prevailed in the lower court, and Autodesk appealed to the Ninth Circuit Court and argued that he did not have the right to sell or resell these products. The key of this case is the impact. He had claimed under 
the Copyright Act that he did not violate Autodesk copyrights because he had some affirmative defenses. The first is the first sale doctrine, which grants the purchaser of a copy of copyrighted material the same rights as the copyright owner to freely transfer and sell the product. And this was his argument that he was initially successful. In addition, he claimed the essential step defense, which is an affirmative defense that if copying of the product was necessary as a necessary step to installation of the product. The Ninth Circuit reviewed his affirmative defense for the first sale doctrine under three different factors, which were whether the SLA labels the purchaser a licensee or an owner, whether it restricts sales and transfer, and whether the owner retains any rights. And the key to this discussion was whether or not Werner was an owner of the copyrighted material or simply a licensee. With these three factors, the Ninth Circuit determined that he was not an owner, so he did not have the right to the copyright owner to sell or distribute this information, and he was merely a licensee. Since the Autodesk license agreement specifically stated that he was a licensee and had specific restrictions on sale, transfer, and distribution of products. In addition, Autodesk specifically claimed in their, their license agreement that they retained those specific rights. So he was ultimately unsuccessful and this was overturned, which reinforced Autodesk's ability to restrict transferability distribution in the sale of its products. In addition to this information, one of the ways that Autodesk is able to keep track and determine whether people are reselling their products is serial numbers. It has a number of different significant reasons that they obtain this information. One is for registration and record keeping. When a company purchases a product, they're required to register that product and submit their company information. This makes it easier for Autodesk to track a company's installations and their licenses. So if there is a later dispute, typically to submit the serial number to Autodesk, they should be able to pull up the company's purchase information, including the number of licenses that they own. However, in terms of the audit, on occasion Autodesk determines that if a serial number is obviously invalid, for example, it is all zeros, or it's in a specific numerical order of one through nine, they will consider that to be an indication of an intent to commit copyright infringement since those are clearly unauthorized serial numbers. And they expect that the company would know that just looking at the serial number itself. And the reason why that's significant is because often Autodesk will, will decide to approach the audit more aggressively if they believe the company specifically intended to commit copyright infringement by obtaining false or unauthorized copies of Autodesk products. In addition to those reasons, Autodesk will often use that information to investigate unauthorized resellers. And they do this by tracking down who the company purchased these products from and, and pursuing copyright infringement claims against the unauthorized resellers as well. There are several common licensing concerns, and these can range from a number of different items. Employees will often make purchases and register software in his or her name and the company can reimburse them. The problem with this is when you go to register your serial numbers and your product information, your company name must be on that material. And the reason is that Autodesk is tracking that information by company. Part of the license agreement restrictions include information about each of the company and those restrictions on transferability means that if an employee purchases it in his or her name, that is the employee's own copy. And that may not be transferred at any point to the company. So if the company reimburses the employee for that information in that product, that does not automatically transfer that product to the employee's to the company's name. So if the employee were to later leave the company, but the Autodesk products remain with that company, it then becomes unauthorized since the employee is no longer using that information and they can't simply transfer that to the company. In some instances where there's a change of company ownership, 
it's a little more complicated and depends specifically on the facts of each case. For example, one company that I dealt with had a change of ownership where the father and son were a partner in a firm and the father retired and so the son took over the firm and changed the name. Well, the products were registered in the initial name with the initial principal, which was his father. So this was the point of contention during our audit, ultimate audit with Autodesk, and went back and forth, and we were ultimately able to reach a resolution. However, Autodesk did offer, as part of that settlement, an ability to change the name of the ownership of the products for a fee. This is not something that Autodesk typically does, and it's specifically restricted in their agreement, but in certain circumstances, you can successfully obtain that information and that change of ownership for, for those products from Autodesk. There are also other concerns. For example, consultants sometimes hire companies specifically to do a project and they want to use a specific product, for example, AutoCAD, as opposed to another, another type of CAD product. And in these instances, I've had situations where these consultants or independents want to provide this software, and the ownership is a little bit fuzzy. And so when it's audited, this, this software is on the company's computers, but it's technically owned by, by the other company that is seeking their assistance in conducting the project. This is something where it's important to have an attorney assist with looking over the licensing terms, especially if it's a situation where you can argue that it is outside of the scope of the audit or if that those products or the computers that are used are not owned by that company. Sometimes if a, comp a consulting company comes in and brings their own equipment and their own software, then it's possibly something that can be limited in scope. However, this is a little bit tricky just because sometimes when you're looking at the agreement, you can determine that none of, none of the products can be used for commercial purposes for that company that's not registered by that company, and that's an argument that Autodesk often makes. So it is important to acknowledge all of the key licensing terms before engaging in any agreement, similar to that. One other problem that our, that our clients often encounter is they will hire summer interns or they will have uh, independent contractors come in. A lot of times their student interns will bring their own version of Autodesk that they have from school or wherever they obtained it, and they will install that on the company's network and often these are educational or student versions. As I stated previously, when you look at the actual terms of the software license agreement, you cannot use a student or educational version for commercial purposes, and that's exactly what is, is happening in a lot of these instances. People hire student interns simply because it's a lot more cost effective than hiring a full CAD operator, and since they come with their own, their own software products, then it makes it a little bit easier for them to organize. But this is a violation of the license agreement. And since they are installed on a company's network, when Autodesk audits and determines this is installed, even if the student has a proper license for their student or educational version, it's still considered copyright infringement and a violation of the software license agreement because that version cannot be used for commercial purposes, and more importantly, it's also not registered to the company. And if it were an actual commercial standalone license, then an external consultant bringing their own copy would be properly licensed to assist with commercial purposes. So for example, if someone had their own standalone copy registered in their name, and they were an independent contractor that wanted to go in and help a company on a specific project, they use that product for their own purposes for assistance in the commercial use of, of the business product, put it only on one computer and used it only themselves and then you know, deleted that product when they left, that would be within the licensing agreement terms and that would be something that, that is acceptable to Autodesk. So it's really important when you use ex external consultants or interns that you're really analyzing 
the type of licenses they're bringing with them, if they're bringing any software, and make a determination whether that's something that can be used for your commercial purposes and whether it's something that is properly licensed to begin with. The, one of the most probably significant licensing concerns is the over-installation of properly licensed products. And this, this situation occurs, I would say probably 95% of my clients, often it's without the principal's knowledge of, of you know, the software installations. And they have, they have a few licenses, for example, AutoCAD or AutoCAD Lite, and then they discover that it's installed on multiple computers. I've had some clients where they had an installation on a computer that was had been decommissioned some time before the audit, and there was no reason for that to be used. But an in-depth analysis revealed that it was simply a backup copy that they had used, that they had installed in the event that anything happened with their initial copy. Now that's something that is fully acceptable under the terms of the license agreement. So that's another important step to determine when you're going through your audit process is to make sure that if you have an over-installation of, of properly licensed products, that they're not legitimately installed as either backup copies or, for example, as I discussed earlier, installed on a laptop specifically for the purposes of using it remotely to access a desktop owned by the same person and used by the same person but not concurrently. So if you have a situation where you have a lot of people who work in the field who also have a desktop, that's something that you should denote in your audit and that note, make a note that, that properly licensed product is also a proper backup for additional remote installation. This will prevent you from being exposed to additional liabilities and ultimately it will decrease your settlement if you have an accurate understanding of what your network has installed. For future compliance, there are a number of different ways that you can assist with determining how you can go about obtaining proper licensing, how you can install the correct protocols to make sure that no one is installing, light, installing products that are not authorized and generally regulating what is installed on in your network. So in the event that you were ever faced with an audit, you are quickly able to obtain the necessary information and also your licensing information and demonstrate that you're properly licensed. One of, one of our recommendations generally to our clients is it's important as part of the employee handbook that you also have confidentiality agreements. Some people go into quite a bit more detail in their confidentiality agreements, and you know that ranges from intellectual property rights to other information. But one of the key reasons why we encourage confidentiality agreements is because it's it's often the case where in different auditing entities, for example, the BSA and SIA, they offer a reward for informants who are able to give them information related to unauthorized software use. Now, that's not always something that's actually granted the, to the informant, but it's certainly an incentive for employees who are either just former employees or generally just disgruntled employees to look at your network and to supply that information to one of these auditing entities, which also includes Autodesk. We've had so many situations where this is the case where a person who's disgruntled will look at the network and then submit all of that information. We also have, I've had probably about seven or eight cases where a disgruntled employee ends up putting a bunch of unauthorized software on the network and then leaving and reporting that information. And you don't want to encounter a situation like that because when you're dealing with the audit process, generally speaking, the auditing entity is not concerned with who installed the product because they consider that the company should be in charge of all of their installations. And so their their position is it doesn't matter who installed it, it should have had better oversight and the company is ultimately responsible for any unlicensed software. So but an employee confidentiality agreement is something that's that's good because you can restrict an employee from disclosing this information. Now, it's not foolproof. 
we also have situations where some of our clients actually have an existing confidentiality agreement in place, and that's violated by the informant. Some of, some of my clients have decided to file a separate civil suit against, against these employees for breach of contract, but some of them are not ultimately successful. And, and the auditing entities, the SIA, BSA, even Autodesk, generally will not disclose the name of the informant, so it's often difficult to pursue litigation without being absolutely positive who informed or who installed these items on your network. I did have one case where they were able to successfully, successfully bring suit against a former employee when they discovered that he had, he had installed an upright software on their network, but that was also tied with the theft of a lot of their intellectual property as well, and they were not only able to pursue civil, a civil lawsuit, they were also able to pursue criminal charges against this individual. But in that instance, the, the auditing entity was the BSA, and they also did not, they did not disclose the name of that, of that informant. They were able to obtain it by other means. In addition to confidentiality agreements, it is important to develop and use a good software use policy. This is just good regardless of auditing or regardless of whether you're facing an audit by Autodesk or any of these other entities, simply because it's in a company's best interest to make sure that they're monitoring, monitoring the use and, um, and downloading and installation of these products by different employees. Some, like a slight, similar to the confidentiality agreement, some companies have extremely in-depth software use policies. We've actually helped certain clients draft their software use policies to help them guide them through the process and make sure their employees know that they are not allowed to install or copy or duplicate any unauthorized software. And this is particularly important because two of the auditing entities will require will require a software use policy anyway as part of their settlement. Specifically, the BSA has what they call the Software Code of Ethics. And this document simply outlines that each of the employees are not allowed to install in any unauthorized software, that the company does not condone the use of the software, and it specifically prevents copyright infringement among the employees. Some people plan to go a little bit more in depth and actually have punitive punitive aspects of the software use policy. Some people uh, offer in, in these agreements that if the employee violates the policy, it can lead to certain negative, negative aspects. For example, one of our clients put in their software use policy that if it was violated more than once, the employee could be terminated. And that, that's a very good deterrent for employees if they're facing termination for simply downloading something that they thought was either free or wasn't really a big deal since it was kind of a smaller software product. It's important, and especially when you're facing Autodesk cases where you're installing products that could cost $1,200 to, you know, AutoCAD is $4,000 and anywhere upwards from there, you don't want a situation where your employees are just copying media and putting it on multiple computers. And by offering a deterrent of that nature, it's less likely that you'll have that that uh, that sort of problem in the future. One of the the key things, regardless of whether you have an employee confidentiality agreement and a software use policy, is that it's really important to conduct routine self audits. And I don't mean that your audit begins as soon as you get an audit letter, because you want to make sure that you're preventing that audit letter from causing you any additional time or monetary constraints. And you want to make sure that your products are, are properly licensed and be able to clean up your systems before you are ever in a position where you're facing potential copyright infringement claims. And, and like I said before, you know, there are a number of ways you can conduct a self-audit. If you're a small environment, you could just simply do a manual inspection of each of your computers, look to add and remove programs and report that and keep it in an updated document. And just update that as, as your environment changes. One other way is obviously we discussed previously the, the free scanning tools. You can purchase a scanning tool as well. For example, 
we offer our own proprietary software that are, that conducts a scan and it's fairly accurate and we review that information before submitting it to Autodesk. So that's something that we offer as well. But if you're not in a position where you're you're intending to pay for a software tool, you can simply download a free online online version. And and I would also recommend in addition to conducting an actual audit from an audit entity, if you're doing a routine self audit, it is equally important to make sure that you're keeping track of any free user tools or free versions or any trial versions as well. And the reason is, is your evaluation and trial versions, a lot of people download that product on their computer. Sometimes it's a stop gap because they, they download it because they're just not in a position where they can afford the full product and they're kind of trying to you know, waste a little bit of time and, and give themselves that 30-day period where they can purchase that product. And that's a problem because the evaluation and trial version specifically are, they were specifically restrict the use of those products for commercial purposes. And often it's not simply used for testing, it's often used for business purposes on a specific project. And so it's important that you're adhering to the terms of the license agreement and only using those for testing, for example, in your environment. And more importantly, that you're removing those products at the expiration of that period. Because when you're scanning or conducting your own audit, you don't want to continually have to clean up your environment by going through and removing these. You remove them as they expire. It's far more manageable to conduct the audits in the future. I would say maybe either a, a quarterly audit is probably appropriate for most environments. Now, if you have a much more detailed and, and larger environment, maybe more frequent audits are appropriate, but absolutely at a minimum, I would, I would absolutely do it once a year for sure. In addition, it's important to make sure that you keep your records. For most of these auditing entities, Autodesk is a little bit different with the serial number. For most of the entities, they will require you to supply your receipt of the products. And it does not matter if the product is so old that you bought it seven years ago, they expect to you to be able to provide your receipt. And you know that, that's something that a lot of people have a problem with because it's just not something that they keep track, with, track of. And if you're in a position where you, for whatever reason, did not supply your serial number or register your product properly, it, is, it will be required for you to find that receipt and prove your ownership of the product in order to avoid any potential copyright claims from Autodesk because their position is the Copyright Act grants them the ability to pursue infringement claims, and once they demonstrate their ownership of the copyright, the burden shifts to the user to prove they have the right to use it and that they own the product or the license for the product. So that's why it's incredibly important to keep good records of all of your purchases, and that applies to all of your software and not just Autodesk products. And so, it's, it's very important to make sure that those are all kept in a place where they're easily accessible. One other more effective way to manage your restrictions on your software use and installations is some, some of our businesses choose to lock down their computers with the administrative right, and their employees are, are actually unable to install any or download any software, regardless of whether or not it's authorized or not. They'll put these restrictions in place to make sure that there is nothing that slips past them. No unauthorized software gets through the cracks. And this is something that's probably one of the more effective ways to manage it, assuming that the individuals with administrative rights also have some level of oversight and checks and balances. In some instances, our clients have had the individuals who actually ended up becoming an informant for either Autodesk or some of the other entities actually had administrative rights and they were former IT experts who had the rights to access the, the materials and all of their networks. So it's extremely important to make sure that the people you trust and trust with your administration, the administrative rights are, are individuals that you can count on that will not ultimately install unauthorized information and disclose the information on your network. Some people prefer 
it's there, the principal of the company to retain those rights, not grant them to anyone else. And that can be very effective as well as far as restricting what can be installed on each of these networks. The last, finally, one of the most important things for managing future compliance is to identify authorized resellers. And the Autodesk offers this information on their on their website. They you can type in on their their address, you can type in your location and it'll bring up all of their authorized resellers. And that's that's very important because we have a lot of situations where clients will simply buy products from eBay or Amazon and even though the sale will demonstrate that it's an authorized reseller, in the case of Timothy Burner and a lot of our clients, they end up they end up with products that are not authorized and that are not legitimate copies. And they have spent thousands of dollars obtaining Autodesk products only to realize that they were not ultimately licensed copies and when they're audited they have no defense against the unlicensed copies and it end up ends up costing these companies a lot of money, especially when they have to go to replace all of these products. So these are all important things to keep in mind when you're you're looking at managing your future compliance and avoiding potential audit in the future. And that concludes our presentation. I appreciate your attention. Thank you very much for joining us. My contact information is on the screen for if you have any questions, please feel free to email me at the address listed at kjohnson at scottandscottllp.com. The phone number is 214-999-2916, so please feel free to contact me and reach out and I will get a, an answer to you as soon as possible. Please join us for our next webinar. It's going to be on August 8th, entitled Storms in the Cloud, the Legal Risks of Commercial Hosting. If you need more details on this information, you can visit our website, scottllp.com, and click on the Events tab. In addition, we also 